Welcome to Lecture 4 for Historical Books, Bright Old Testament 510. Today we're going to be starting our study of 1st and 2nd Samuel. We'll be dividing it up into three to three and a half different lectures, but today we'll begin looking at the book in general and looking at the first eight or so chapters of the book. This book covers the life of Samuel, the life of Saul, the life of David. However, Samuel is the key figure that ties all the books together, and he's the first figure, important figure mentioned in the book, which is why the book bears his name. But let's go ahead and dive in. Let's begin with a very basic question. Why do we have two books of Samuel? Well, originally in the Hebrew text, the book of Samuel comprised one book. However, when the Hebrew text was translated into Greek, 1 Samuel was too long to fit on a single Greek scroll, so instead it was divided into two. However, it was not called 1 and 2 Samuel. The Septuagint actually refers to 1, 2, 3, 4 kingdoms, considering all four books, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, to be one book, divided up into four pieces. The Septuagint is the one that began the division into four. The Latin text continued that division into four, but changed the name from kingdoms to kings. Eventually, in the 1500s, we found a Hebrew manuscript from the 1400s that had the books divided up 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. And the Bomberg Bible, uh, in 1517, became the first English text to use that division, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. Since that time, every English text has divided it the same way. We have to keep in mind, though, that 1st and 2nd Samuel were originally one book in the Hebrew text, and it is at least possible, although probably not likely given the different styles of writing, that 1st and 2nd Samuel were actually one book with 1st and 2nd Kings. We have to keep this in mind, especially when we're dividing where the books start and the books stop, as we consider where the division exists between Samuel and Kings. Just because we have a division at the end of 2nd Samuel 24 doesn't mean that that's necessarily where the story ends, as David is still alive at the end of 2nd Samuel, and dies in the first couple chapters of 1 Kings. So we need to at least consider Kings as we're studying Samuel, in the same way that we consider Judges as we study Samuel. Understanding that the books have a long history together, at least in the New Testament era, for the last 2,000 years, but potentially even longer, where 1st and 2nd Samuel was read alongside 1st and 2nd Kings, keeping in mind that 1st and 2nd Kings is written much later than 1st and 2nd Samuel, since Kings is written after the exile, and 1st and 2nd Samuel are likely not. However, at least in our era, they have been read together. So in our English text, and in this class, we still consider 1st and 2nd Samuel separate from 1st and 2nd Kings. Who wrote 1st and 2nd Samuel? The reality is that we don't know, and even theories as to who wrote the book would be tied specifically to the dating of the books. If we say that the books were written after the exile, the author would obviously have to be someone after the exile. If we say that it was written during the reign of Solomon, that author will be somebody who lived much earlier. We know that Samuel did not actually write Samuel, because Samuel dies in 1 Samuel 25. And while there are some who claim that Moses was inspired to write about his death at the end of Deuteronomy before he died, it's unlikely that Samuel was inspired to write several chapters of 1 Samuel and all of 2 Samuel before he died. It's far more logical to say that someone else wrote the book. But as to who this other person is, we simply do not know. Is it Nathan? Is it Gad? Is it Josiah? Is it someone that Solomon commissions to write the book? Is it someone that Hezekiah commissions to write the book, perhaps while they're putting together the Proverbs and the Psalms? We really don't know. All we're left with is conjecture. We don't know who wrote the book. We do know that they certainly had a theological agenda in mind, and that's very evident within the books. But beyond this, we're not really sure. Again, we've seen the similarity, and we'll talk about it in just a moment, between Samuel, Joshua, and Judges, and perhaps the same author wrote all of them, as Note has suggested, the Deuteronomist or the Deuteronomistic redactor that redacted the book later on, perhaps after the exile. But beyond those similarities between different books, we don't really know who the identity is of the author of First and Second Samuel. We're simply left with our theories. Another basic question when we approach the interpretation of 1st and 2nd Samuel is when was 1st and 2nd Samuel written? Again, this is a conundrum. However, there are some clues within the book that suggest that the book is really old. Well, of course the book is old. It was written before the time of Christ. 
However, there are some clues within the book that suggest that it was written very early on in Israel's monarchy, perhaps even during the reign of David at the end of his lifetime prior to him dying, since he doesn't die until 1 Kings, although it's possible that it was even written during the time of Solomon or perhaps shortly thereafter. The situation going on in Israel during the time of Solomon seems to fit when we, we would expect a book to be written in defense of David as a history of Solomon's rise to kingship and how David extended the borders of Israel to where we find them in the reign of Solomon. But beyond this, there are several other clues, such as the archaic forms of Hebrew that we find in this book. We have in Hebrew two different ways of writing, a defective way, where particular letters are often left out. They're not necessarily required, but it became customary over time to write in a plene way, or a full way, inserting all of the letters that we might expect into the text. However, we don't see this in the book of David. Instead, we see a lot of defective writing, where those letters, those helping letters, are missing. This shows us that the Hebrew of the text is very ancient. We also have some interesting usages of the Hebrew as we're translating names from Aramaic and other languages into Hebrew, as well as the mention of other ancient kings, who in turn then mention David in their monuments and in their inscriptions, what we often call steels or stellas, depending on how you want to pronounce that name, as they indicate that David was the king of Judah and the king of Israel at the time that they themselves were reigning. In fact, Shishak uh, in Egypt even refers to David as a highlands king, referencing the fact that David had garrisons in the Negev or in the highlands areas of Israel. We also see reflected in the text a lot of archaic landmarks. Similar to if we were explaining our background, we would indicate uh, landmarks that are existing when we are picturing the story as having taken place. However, we would not do this deliberately to make the story seem old. We would actually do it subconsciously, simply including those landmarks that we remember or those landmarks that are a crucial part of the story. However, in the text of 1st and 2nd Samuel, the writer of 1st and 2nd Samuel also includes ancient archaic landmarks. Uh, again, this is not something that he did simply to make the book seem old because they don't really pay a large part in the story. He simply included them because that was his time reference. That was when he was considering the story as having taken place, perhaps even this remembered the story as having taken place. So these are inserted into the text as a subtle reminder and a subtle indication that the text comes from an ancient time, a time when the borders of Israel had not yet been fully pushed out to where they were in the reign of Solomon. A lot of these theories and sources for our dating of Samuel to the time of Solomon or thereabouts can be found in a book by Baruch Halpern, David's Secret Demons, Messiah, Murderer, Traitor, King. What I really like about this particular support and reference is that I don't like the book. Baruch Halpern is often a liberal. He often does not defend our understanding of inspiration or inerrancy. He has no agenda to try to defend David in First and Second Samuel or its authenticity. In fact, he seems to be very much set on the opposite that 1st and 2nd Samuel was written to whitewash the story of David and that it's not historically reliable. Instead, he seems to find the opposite to be true in pretty much every story, assuming that the opposite of what is said must be true. And yet even Halpern thinks that the book is very ancient, written very early on, either uh, during the reign of Solomon or shortly thereafter. So here we have a liberal who's not a scholar, he's a Jewish scholar, he's not a secular scholar, but he is a scholar who doesn't really have the same agenda as Christians or evangelicals or those interpreting the text in an inerrant, inspired sort of way, and yet even he believes that the books are ancient, again, giving more evidence to support our case. I personally think that it was probably written during the time of Solomon as a defense, not so much as Halpern suggests, of Solomon coming to be king over his brothers, but rather as an explanation of how Solomon came to power and how God brought him to that point and how God used David. First and Second Samuel are certainly theological, and they seem to be theologically minded for the leaders, for the kings, for the priests, for the prophets in Israel, so that it would make sense for Solomon, a man of wisdom, to have commissioned a book of history that is not just history, the way First and Second Kings is, but is a theological history, 
trying to teach and explain how the leaders of Israel are supposed to act. So while we can't say definitively when the book was written, it seems likely that it was written either at the end of David's reign or shortly thereafter, perhaps during the reign of Solomon. The most basic question to 1st and 2nd Samuel is why was 1st and 2nd Samuel written? There are a number of answers that could be given to this question, all based upon the themes of 1st and 2nd Samuel. In 1st Samuel chapter 2, we see God tell Eli that those who honor God, God will honor, and those who despise God, God will belittle. This seems to be a, at least a minor theme, but probably a major theme that flows through the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel, as it connects again and again and again with various leaders, seeking to teach the leaders who would read the book of 1st and 2nd Samuel that honor is not to be found in personal conquest, but to be found in trust in God, relying upon God to give to the leader what he needs, the glory that he needs if he will only lead Israel to glorify God. This is probably not the theme in First and Second Samuel. Another theme that might even be more important is the theme of seeing, the theme of eyes, which we'll get to in just a few slides. The idea that the people in Israel need to see with eyes of faith if they're really going to see what's going on. Unfortunately, so many of the characters in First and Second Samuel do not see what's going on what is clear to us as readers, but they themselves miss it. Perhaps First and Second Samuel, then, was written as a call to repentance, a call to faith in God. It's also possible that the books were written as a defense of Solomon, or even a defense of David, or even a defense of Judah in the southern kingdom, emphasizing both the construction of the temple, since the land is selected for the temple at the end of Second Samuel, or emphasizing the Davidic covenant and the fact that someone from David's line will sit on the throne forever. In the end, the books themselves are history, but they are definitely theologically minded. They are intended to teach something. And so whether or not we can narrow down exactly what that one particular element is that's being taught, it is obvious that the books of First and Second Samuel were written to teach, not simply give historical facts. They were intended to teach and to call Israel and her leaders to a specific set of behaviors, to specific perspective of faith, and to a specific relationship with God. One of the more interesting questions is the relationship between the books of First and Second Samuel and the book of Judges. Remembering that in the Old Testament Hebrew Bible, the book of Judges comes immediately before First and Second Samuel, Ruth being found elsewhere in the writings, Judges and Samuel are found in the prophets, often called the former prophets, as opposed to the latter prophets, which are what we call the major minor prophets. Samuel and Judges have a lot in common. And the big question that we're facing as we come to the end of the book of Judges is, are we at the end of a cycle? Are we at the end of the cycle? Are we no longer on that crazy cycle that's found in the Judges of the people leaving God and then being punished and then crying out to God for a deliverer and then God raising up a judge, and then the judge serving until he dies, and then once he dies, the people apostatizing. As we open the book of 1 Samuel, we have a situation of a judge. However, we don't have a righteous judge, and we don't have a warrior judge. Instead, we have a high priest who is judging and is doing a very bad job of it. He apparently doesn't know what praying people look like as he sees Hannah at the temple. He doesn't notice that his sons are doing heinous things, or if he does notice, he chooses not to notice. He's turning his back on the sin of priests and the sin of his sons, when they should be removed, in fact, even executed for stealing the Lord's sacrifices. So we have a bad judge here, which gives us the impression that we have simply continued the trajectory, starting again at Othniel all the way down through Samson, passing through the situation with Gibeah and the destruction of Benjamin, and going right on into Eli so that as the book opens, it doesn't seem that much has changed. And then when Eli dies, the question is, does the cycle continue? Are we going to wait for another judge to be raised up? Or is Samuel that other judge? Perhaps, as the people are following after Samuel and defeating the Philistines in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 7, perhaps the people have finally turned to God and the cycle has ended, and yet when we get to chapter 8 and they request a king, we're perplexed. Does this mean that the cycle is continuing? 
it seems as we come to the end of the life of Eli and the end of the life of Samuel that we're seeing the end of a cycle and we're expecting the people to apostatize and for the cycle to simply continue. So what is the relationship then between Samuel and Judges, between Samuel and the cycle of the Judges? Are we to understand Samuel is simply continuing that process so that we see a cycle no longer of the Judges but now a cycle of the Kings? Or are we supposed to understand the Kings as ending the cycle? This is an interpretive question and a very important one as we determine what is the relationship of David to that cycle because when David and Solomon fall away from God, they lead the whole nation away from God. And David leads the people back, but we don't see any indication that Solomon repents at the end of his lifetime and comes back to God. And then we see a continuation of uh, this cycle all the way through 2 Kings. So where does the cycle end? Does it end? This is a major question as we examine Samuel. Is Samuel the end of the cycle? Is David the end of the cycle? Is the cycle complete? Or does the cycle keep going? A closely related question to the issue of the connection between Samuel and Judges is the line in the book of Judges, there was no king in those days and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That particular phrase shows up four times in the last few chapters of the book of Judges as the book of Judges concludes even with that final statement. As the book of 1 Samuel opens, we of course know that we're headed towards a king in chapter 9 with King Saul, which raises the question as to whether or not the author of Judges knew that there was a king currently reigning at the time that he was writing, even if he was speaking of an ancient time, a time several years or decades before when there was no king. And if so, what particular king is the writer of Judges writing under? Is he writing under the reign of Saul? It seems as though the end of Judges is aware of King Saul, and we've already discussed several of the possible connections between the end of Judges and Saul, Saul being from Gibeah, Saul being a man of Benjamin, Saul having 600 men, Saul cutting up the oxen that he is plowing his field with, similar to the way that the Levite cuts up his concubine and mails her to the 12 parts of Israel. So too Saul calls everybody out in war in order to save the men of Jabesh Gilead. So we have definitely a connection between Judges and 1 Samuel. The question, though, still remains, which king is the book of Judges written underneath? It would seem as though the writer of Judges would not consider Saul to be the fulfillment of the need for a king, since under the reign of Saul, Saul himself does what is right in his own eyes, which would imply that it's either David or Solomon or a later king that the writer of Judges is referring to, when he gives the implication that there is a king in his day, even though there wasn't in the period of the judges, but we still have no way of defending which king. Which king was he writing underneath? Perhaps he's even writing after the time of kings and writing in the exile, as some have argued. In that case, he's referring back to a time when there was a king and in a sense calling for there to be a king again, even as he's longing for the Messiah, the one who would come and restart David's throne. So the reality is that we don't know, but it would imply that there is a connection between 1 Samuel, where the first kings are actually put into plower, and the end of the book of Judges that anticipates that king. This is a major connection between the two books and ones that has to be kept in mind. However, the first eight chapters of 1 Samuel also suggest that the king all along has been God, which is also the implication of the end of the book of Judges, in fact, all of the book of Judges. So that in 1 Samuel chapter 8, when the people ask for a king, God says, they haven't just rejected Samuel as a judge, they have rejected God as king over them. They don't want a king they cannot see, instead they want a judge that they can see. This goes back again to that statement, there was no king in those days, because the lingering answer is, well, yes, there was. God was always king. God was protecting, God was providing. It's just simply that the people of Israel did not recognize him as king, did not submit to him as king, did not obey him or serve him as king. Instead, they put their faith in their judges, just like in the book of 1 Samuel, they put their faith in their human king. So, yes, there has always been a king in Israel, and yet, no, there's not a king in Israel, until the book of 1 Samuel, again, connecting potentially these two books. If we understand the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel and Judges as being closely related, we're left with the question of why the book of Judges even ends the way it does. 
up through chapter 16, we're going steadily downhill until we get to the end of Samson's life. And then in 17 through 21, we have the interesting stories of the Levite and the destruction of the tribe of Benjamin, as well as the fact that they are kidnapping women from Shiloh, which is where the Ark of the Covenant is located. And then as we begin in 1 Samuel, we see several of these same concepts return. Saul is from Gibeah, as we find out in chapter 10. The Ark of the Covenant is still in Shiloh, at least in chapters 1 through 4. And we have a certain man from the hill country. Elkanah is referred to that way. Saul passes through the hill country of Ephraim, as well as Nabal, the fool, who is in the hill country of Ephraim, reminding us of the certain man from the hill country of Ephraim at the end of the book of Judges, the Levite with the concubine, which sparks the whole situation with the devoting to destruction of the tribe of Benjamin. So again, we have all of these connections deliberately made between the end of the book of Judges and the beginning of 1 Samuel. So why end the book of Judges where it ends and start 1 Samuel? We don't really have a definitive answer to this question, other than the fact that 1 and 2 Samuel seem to be bookended by a poem. So in 1 Samuel chapter 2, we see the bookend of Hannah's prayer, and at the end of 2 Samuel, we see the other bookend of David's prayer. So again, we do have a description and a definition of the fact that we have two books, but we do have an interesting connection between the book of Samuel and the book of Judges, as we see these many separate themes that are connected between the two books. Again, raising in our minds the question of how we interpret 1 Samuel, we must interpret it with judges in mind, as much as we have in mind of where we're going in 1 Kings. Thus, the temple explains much that goes on in 1 and 2 Samuel, but the book of Judges also explains what goes on in 1 and 2 Samuel. There's a reason why the book of Judges ends the way it does, as though it's anticipating 1 and 2 Samuel, and there's a reason why 1 and 2 Samuel uses the phrase that it does and starts out the way that it does giving the impression that it is simply a continuation of the book of Judges. This is deliberate, both in an effort to show that it is similar to the book of Judges, and that the cycle is similarly continuing, but also to show that it's distinct from Judges, so that you recall the book of Judges, but then see something different as taking place in the book of First and Second Samuel. Again, this has been crafted by the author for deliberate purposes, in order to connect the two books for theological reasons, but it is a direct, direct, important, intentional connection between the two books. So something that we must keep in mind as we're examining First and Second Samuel. One of the other fascinating questions about First and Second Samuel is not just why does the book of Judges end where it ends, and the book of First and Second Samuel start where it starts, but why does the book of First and Second Samuel end where the book of First and Second Samuel ends? The end of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 24, seems to assume that the temple has already been built. Otherwise, the purchasing of the threshing floor of Aruna the uh, Jebusite makes absolutely no sense. It seems like a completely random story until we realize, as is explained in 1 Kings, that the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite is the location of the temple, where Solomon will build the temple. So either the temple is already built, or it is known that the temple is going to be built. Therefore, 2 Samuel assumes the presence of the temple being built in 1 Kings. But why doesn't the book of 2 Samuel end with Solomon already king? In fact, as the book of 2 Samuel ends, David is rejoicing that he is free from all of his enemies, as we have that book end of the psalm there in Samuel 22 and 23, but why is there no successor? We don't know who's going to be king. Not to mention the fact that David is not dead at the end of the book. In fact, he's not even sick at the end of the book. I suggested that this may demonstrate the fact that it was written during David's lifetime. However, then we would have to assume that not only was it written late in David's lifetime, but that David prophetically knew that the temple was going to be built on the site of the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite, which is not out of the question since David at some point explains to Solomon that that's where the temple is supposed to go, and since we also have David in Chronicles telling Solomon that he has prophetically explained to Solomon how the temple is supposed to be built. So even though Solomon's the one who builds it, David is the one who designs it by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So it's not completely out of the question, 
to say that David is still alive as 2 Samuel is being written. What is, though, very clear is that the end of 2 Samuel assumes that a temple is going to be built. In fact, there's even the connection of the story itself of 2 Samuel 24, that here is David numbering the men, he's counting them up so that he can see how big his army is, and God comes along and reminds him, no, you have to rely upon me. Part of the problem, though, is that David did not pay the tax that was supposed to be paid whenever a census was taken. He doesn't pay the tax, but the tax was supposed to be a reminder of how desperately you need the tabernacle, how desperately you need the temple, and really how desperately you need God to save you. And so here is the temple, this picture of reliance upon the sacrifice of the goats and the bulls, and ultimately upon the sacrifice of the Messiah, that all comes about because David does not rely upon God at this particular moment. So 2 Samuel ends here kind of looking forward to Kings, and yet it doesn't actually indicate that any of the stuff that takes place in Kings has actually taken place or will take place. If we didn't have First and Second Kings, we would read the end of 2 Samuel and say, gee, that's nice, the plague was stopped, but what an odd place to end a book. It's as though the writer of Samuel knew there is more to the story that is coming. Again, prophetically, possibly, more realistically, I would say, is that he knew that the book of First and Second Kings was either being written or was going to be written, or he knew the history of Israel to know the temple was about to be built or was built, and this is why it was built, because of the sin of David in numbering the people. And so all of it ties together here at the end of the book, but again, that assumes the presence of First and Second Kings. That assumes that Samuel ends with the story on somewhat of a cliffhanger. We don't really know what's going to happen. We don't know who the successor is. We don't know why this particular story shows up at the end of the book. We're just left hanging, similar to the way that we are at the end of the book of Judges. The one indication that we have that First and Second Samuel is a complete unit and does not extend previous to 1 Samuel or past 2 Samuel is the fact that we have this song that shows up in 1 Samuel chapter 2, Hannah's song, and another song that shows up in 2 Samuel 22 through 23. So we have Hannah going to the tabernacle and praying at the beginning of the book. We have David going to the future site of the temple at the end of the book and setting the place for the temple. Both of those stories then are surrounded by a song that really bookends the book of Samuel. Not to mention the fact that eventually the style of the book of Kings is completely different than the style of First and Second Samuel. The first couple chapters of First Kings seem very similar, but pretty quickly we're able to determine that we are no longer in the book of First and Second Samuel. So all of that to say that as we consider First and Second Samuel, we need to consider it in light of Judges, we need to consider it in light of 1 Kings. It's why one scholar in particular actually says that Samuel is a bridge between judge and king. Although, again, as we have seen several times, Joshua is really a bridge between Deuteronomy and Judges. Judges is a bridge between Joshua and 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel is a bridge between Judges and Kings, and Kings gets us to the post-exilic period. So really, any book could be called a bridge but we certainly see the connection between Samuel, Judges, and Kings, which again is what motivated uh, Martin Note to say that this was the Deuteronomistic history, all written by the same person. Again, I'm not convinced, but we do see the similarity, and we need to keep that in mind as we're studying the book. The book of First and Second Samuel is the unit that it's supposed to be, book ended by that song, but we have to keep the other surrounding books in mind as we study it. It cannot be studied in isolation. The structure of 1st and 2nd Samuel is fairly agreed upon within scholarship. What is not agreed upon is how the structure came to be. Many people have suggested over the last several decades, in fact over the last century, using source criticism and other forms of criticism of 1st and 2nd Samuel, that the structure is based upon ancient documents which were pulled together to form 1st and 2nd Samuel. Thus, we have David's rise in 1st Samuel 16 through 2nd Samuel 1, this being a document, and then the succession document being 2 Samuel chapter 9, or sometimes chapter 8, 9, or 10, depending on who's dividing it, up through 2 Kings chapter 2, who it is that's going to succeed David. However, there is no reason to suggest that there are actual documents that traveled independently of one another that were then pulled together together. 
What's clear is that the writer of First and Second Samuel is using sources. In fact, he's probably even using Samuel in some of Samuel's writings, which are referenced at least once in the book as a source, as well as probably the records of Gad and Nathan. So to say that it's using sources is not out of the question. To suggest that these particular narratives were separate books that have then been pulled together is probably taking it a little far. I've divided the book up slightly differently, not so much with different divisions, but just calling them something different. So in 1 Samuel chapter 1 through chapter 8, we have pre-Saul, really the transition between the book of Judges and the first king. And then we have Saul's rise and fall in 1 Samuel 9 through 15, and really 9 through 15 and then to the end of the chapter. But we have David's rise in 1 Samuel 16 through 2 Samuel 1 that overlaps Saul's fall. We then have Saul, David's reign from 2 Samuel chapter 1 or 2, really through the end of 2 Samuel. But to divide it up, I've put it through 2 Samuel 8, 9, or 10, give or take with David's fall being in 2 Samuel 11, and then the ensuing travesties that occur within his family from chapter 11 through chapter 21. And then we do have David's replacement or the succession narrative from 2 Samuel chapter 9 through 2 Kings chapter 2. Again, this is a loose structure, a loose outline of the book. There are probably other ways that it could be outlined, but this seems to be the major structure of the book. Just as in Judges, we had three sections a prologue, as it were, then the reign of the judges, and then the postlogue. Here we have the prologue being before Saul, then Saul, David, and then the book ends rather abruptly at the end in 2 Samuel chapter 24 with the dedication of the threshing floor of the Jebusite, Aruna. We don't really find the succession until 2 Kings chapter 1 or 2, but that's why I've connected it here with David's replacement. There in chapter 1 and 2, we find out that Solomon is the replacement, which we kind of knew all along because when Solomon was born, he was called Jedediah, or the Lord's Beloved. So we had a pretty good idea that that was going to be the case, not to mention the fact that the only person who seems to be older than, uh, than Solomon is Adonijah, and Adonijah attempts to set up his own kingdom after David is incapacitated. It just simply doesn't work. We're really going to focus on the first eight chapters of Samuel for our lecture today, the era pre-Saul. Again, this is the era that takes us from the last judge, being Samson, through Eli, and then after Eli's death to Samuel, and then after Samuel to his sons, although we're told that his sons are wicked, it's not likely that his sons were necessarily national judges because they're serving alongside their father, Samuel is serving in Ramah in the north in the hill country of Ephraim. The two sons, uh, Joel and Abiah, are actually serving in Beersheba, which is all the way in the south of Israel. And yet the elders still seem to understand that when Samuel is gone, that the sons are going to step into that position of judge. So there is some national aspect of it, even though they're serving as a local judge in the south. Samuel, of course, uh, is asked to appoint a king in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Which brings us then to the monarchy, which begins in chapter 9 and following. There's two themes that are primarily mentioned in the first couple chapters of Samuel. One has to do with glory, uh, that is, those that glorify God, God will glorify. Again, the word is kavod, which means heavy or weighty or glorious, shiny, literally. It has a number of different meanings, and there's a number of play on words in the first couple of chapters because of this word kavod. Eli is told that he will not receive glory because he has not given glory to God. Instead, he has despised God by choosing his sons over God. But we're told in chapter 3 that Eli is a heavy man, kavod, not meaning that he's full of glory, but meaning that he's fat. He's so fat that when he falls off of his chair, he dies. We're also told about the glory of Dagon versus the glory of Yahweh in the chapters that deal with the Ark of the Covenant going to Philistia. And there the elders of Philistia say that they should not harden their hearts as the Egyptians did, which again is that word kavo, don't make your hearts heavy, don't harden your hearts. So we have a number of plays on words there in the first couple of chapters using this word kavod in its various translations. Again, that constant emphasis upon kavod, 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 which then fades away and we don't see it again until 1 Samuel 15, 
where Saul is very concerned about his personal kavod for defeating the enemies of God. We also have an emphasis in these chapters on seeing, really a lack of seeing. Elkanah does not see what's going on in his own family and the tension that is being caused there. Uh, Eli does not see that Hannah is praying. Eli does not see what his sons are doing. Eli does not see when the messenger returns from the battle after the Ark of the Covenant has been captured. Uh, Samuel does not see what his sons are doing. Israel does not see what is going on. Neither do the Philistines when their god Dagon ends up having his head cut off and his arms cut off. Not his legs because he has a tail. He's a giant fish but has his arms and his head cut off and placed on the threshold of their temple, they still don't see what is going on. So we have this ongoing emphasis upon seeing and a lack of seeing, all the way up through chapter 8, where Israel does not see what they have as king in God and what they have as judge in Samuel. So again, an emphasis upon seeing. This introduces these two themes that will really last through the entire book, that There are people who cannot see, and there are people who do not understand glory, and those two play hand in hand. Within the first couple chapters of 1 Samuel, we see a complete reversal. This is very common within the Old Testament, but especially within 1 Samuel, where those who are low are exalted. Again, God says, those who glorify me, I will exalt, I will glorify, I will honor. And those who choose to honor themselves, God belittles. God brings low. We have, at the beginning of 1 Samuel, an emphasis upon the Elides, or the Elides, I suppose we could say. These are the descendants of Eli, just like we will later on refer to the Omrids to talk about the descendants of King Omri in northern Israel. The Eli line, or the Elides, are going to end because Eli has despised God, and his sons have certainly despised God, taking the sacrifices that they were not supposed to take. They were supposed to be cut off or executed for what they had done, but Eli chooses to turn a blind eye, just simply warning them a time or two. And God again emphasizes that idea of seeing by saying that those who descend from Eli will instead weep their eyes out that their eyes will fail because of all of their weeping in the future. And eventually, at the end of David's reign, this is going to come to pass as uh, Abiathar is no longer the priest. Instead, Solomon sets up a new high priest and sends Abiathar home, thus ending the line of Eli as priests. The grand reversal, though, that takes place here is that Hannah has no children. Her rival, Penina, does have children, And she says that she has been exalted, Hannah has been exalted, suggesting that Penina has been brought low, but not so much that Penina has lost all of her children, but simply that Penina has been humbled as she's been mocking Hannah. Now the mockery has been proved to be useless because now Hannah will have children. She will actually have six children, uh, Samuel plus five more. But really, her emphasis within the song that she sings in 1 Samuel chapter 2 is the fact that the descendants of Eli are going to be brought low, while the descendants of Hannah, that is Samuel, are going to be exalted. So even though this is all started with a glorious future for the descendants of Eli, it is going to be taken. And even though Hannah feels like she has very little future because of the fact that she has no children, she is going to have a glorious future because she will be remembered for all time. It's worth noting that Elkanah, her husband, is completely clueless as to what's going on, and he is not mentioned for all time. He disappears after chapter 2. Hannah's faith is fairly remarkable in these first couple chapters. Not only does she go and pray, not only does she make vows, not only does she bring sacrifices, basically doing all the things that her husband was supposed to do, she specifically requests a son. She wants a man-child or a child of men because she believes that Samuel is the answer to the leadership vacuum in Israel. Remember, there is no king in those days and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Hannah specifically mentions a king in First Samuel chapter 2 perhaps prophetically speaking ahead of David. She doesn't think that her son is going to be king because she gives him to God. He's going to be a priest, not a king, even though he functions as a judge. 
but she understands that Samuel is part of the future of Israel and part eventually of the kingship as he will anoint the first two kings of Israel, Saul and David. So we see the grand reversal that takes place here. We see the lack of seeing on Eli's part, not seeing what his sons are doing and being brought low because of it. We also see a grand reversal then in the story of the Philistines, which we'll get to in just a moment. 1 Samuel chapter 3 is often called the call of Samuel. However, you will notice as you read 1 Samuel chapter 3 that there is no mention as to what Samuel is ever supposed to do. We infer that something must have happened in the conversation or that somehow Samuel came to understand that he was supposed to be the priest, he was supposed to be the prophet, as the chapter ends saying that none of the words of Samuel ever fell to the ground and people understood that God spoke through Samuel, which is a change of the way things were going in Israel because the chapter begins by telling us that the word was rare in those days and there was no frequent vision. And yet by the end, God is appearing to Samuel at Shiloh and revealing himself there so that the word of the Lord comes to Israel. The call, though, is not so much a call throughout 1 Samuel chapter 3 as much as it is a call to repentance to Eli to see what his sons are doing. It's the second such call. Again, the word of the Lord is rare in those days, and yet here, twice, we see the word of the Lord come to Eli trying to get his attention. Of course, it doesn't work, and the situation goes from bad to worse as Eli gives permission for the Ark of the Covenant to be carried into battle in 1 Samuel chapter 4 where it is subsequently captured. The Israelites thought that they could manipulate God by bringing the Ark of the Covenant, the earthly throne of God, into battle, assuming that because God goes where the Ark goes, if the Ark is in danger, God will protect himself and protect Israel. Of course, it doesn't work that way, and thousands of them die, and the Ark of the Covenant goes into captivity in Philistia. So all of this has brought about the fulfillment of the word that comes to Samuel, warning him about what's going to happen to Eli. But again, it's not just for Samuel's sake, it's really for Eli's sake to call him to repentance. Unfortunately, it is a call that is completely ignored, and he and his sons die on the same day, as does his daughter-in-law, as she dies in birth. At the end of 1 Samuel chapter 4, the Ark of the Covenant is captured and goes into captivity and begins to wreak havoc on the Philistines, really showing them that their God is worthless. Ironically, they don't turn from their God. They're concerned that God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, is beating up on their God, but they actually continue to serve Dagon. In fact, rather than seeing that their God is worthless because he lost his head and his hands, they decide superstitiously not to step on the threshold where the head and the hands had ended up after they were removed. Eventually, they are struck with such plagues. Uh, The word is often translated as tumors or hemorrhoids. Uh, Really, it is something in the nether regions of the male anatomy that prohibits them from having children. There have been all sorts of different theories, some of them quite graphic. Basically, they're not able to do what they normally do to have children because of their pain and their suffering and their agony, as well as a plague that has come out and just struck people dead. Not to mention the fact that by the end of the chapter, we see the Ark of the Covenant affecting Israel as well. So the Ark of the Covenant's glory, again, that major theme is being emphasized here, both for the people of Israel and for the Philistines. The Philistines first figure it out. They repent. They offer a sacrifice, a burnt offering, a atoning sacrifice, and send back the Ark of the Covenant to to Israel, where it ends up in Beth Shemesh. They send it back with golden mice and golden tumors, or golden hemorrhoids, again, an odd thing, but in keeping with what had struck them, uh, perhaps these are uh, golden statues of male organs, which were very common in the ancient Near East, and it's possible that was what was in the Ark of the Covenant alongside these mice. God has struck the fertility of Philistia. They can't have crops because of the mice. They can't have children because of the hemorrhoids or whatever the nether regions are doing in Philistia. And so they realize that Dagon, who is a god of fertility, is actually being destroyed by the god of Israel. So what better thing to do than get rid of it? They put the Ark of the Covenant on a cart, they send it off where it ends up in Beth Shemesh, which again reminds us that we saw Beth Shemesh back at the beginning of Judges, although this is a different Beth Shemesh. Uh, 
That one was in Naphtali. This one is closer to Judah uh, in Jer near Jerusalem. The Ark of the Covenant comes back, and the people there in Beth Shemesh look in it and are struck dead, apparently thinking that because the Ark of the Covenant didn't defend them in battle, it must have no power. God has demonstrated, though, his glory and his power both in Philistia and in Israel. Eventually, the Ark of the Covenant is sent off to a priest's house, where it will remain for the next 20 years. 1 Samuel chapter 7 is a cycle of repentance that looks very much like Judges chapter 10. It is a sincere repentance as the people put away their idols and turn back to God. They then go out and defeat the Philistines who have come to attack them at Mizpah, and Samuel sets up his very famous Ebenezer, his rock of help, the monument reminding Israel of the fact that God has delivered them. God thunders against the Philistines. Again, Dagon being a god of fertility would have been understood to be a god of thunder. So it's ironic that God destroys the Philistines with their own weapon, with thunder, showing that he is over the thunder, not Dagon. Dagon being an inferior uh, fertility god of the Philistines. Some people have tried to connect Dagon with Baal or Dagon with El or some other god. But basically, he's a fertility war god, uh, very common in the ancient Near East, and associated with clouds and thunder and lightning, just like God uses when he descends on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus. Once the Ark of the Covenant has come back, it has stayed at the priest's house for about 20 years, and the people of Israel began to mourn, and they began to cry out to God for deliverance from their enemies. But just like in Judges chapter 10, they do so sincerely. At least we think it's sincerely, and we get the impression that they were sincere and that this repentance stuck, as it were, from that time until the time in 1 Samuel chapter 8 when Samuel grows old. So if we assume that Samuel was a young child in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and 3 when the Ark of the Covenant goes into captivity, it's in captivity for seven months and then 20 years, and then Samuel is coming and doing the sacrifice as they go out to defeat the Philistines in chapter 7. So perhaps Samuel is only in his 20s or 30s at this point. And then when we get to chapter 8, he's old. I'll let you decide how old old is. I picture somebody really old, although Samuel still has some spunk left. He's not so old that he can't do anything. He still has more to do after chapter 8. But in chapter 8, he is old, so we've had quite a bit of time that has passed from chapter 7 to chapter 8, and the people do not appear to have fallen away. So we're beginning to get hints of the fact that the cycle that we saw in the book of Judges is breaking to a point. The cycle will come back, unfortunately, and it will degrade to the point that Israel ends up in exile, both in the north and in the south, and yet at least for a time at least through the reign of Saul, the reign of David, and part of the reign of Solomon, Israel is following after God. Saul, for all of his spiritual incompetencies, which we'll look at in our next few lectures, still does not lead Israel into idolatry, doesn't lead them towards following other gods. Instead, one way or another, although he seems to not have an elevator that quite goes to the top spiritually, he still emphasizes the worship of God and still gets them to make vows to God and to follow after God, even though it's clear that he's a spiritual moron. But still, Israel is following after God all the way through the lifetime of Samuel, all the way through the lifetime of Saul, David, and part of Solomon. So we're going to go 50, 60, 70 years here of faithfulness to God, which is a long period of time. We haven't had that stretch of time since early on in the period of the judges. So we've seen repentance here in chapter 7, and yet unfortunately chapter 8 will turn things of showing us that Israel may have repented, but they don't really understand what's going on. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, we see the request for a king. This is a real slap in the face to Samuel, but ultimately a slap in the face to God, because God is the king of Israel. That's been the whole point through the book of Judges, and even though Gideon doesn't seem to have fully understood his statement when he said he would not be king, the emphasis has been on these judges serving as God's right hand, but God ultimately being the king. Really, when David becomes king, we're actually going back to that arrangement, although we're going to have a title and we're going to have a warrior, but there's still an emphasis on the fact that God is the king, and that the king, as in Psalm 2, is his anointed one, his son, who is going to do his bidding, 
but still it is ultimately God who is in control. Again, this was the point back in Judges all the way through 1 Samuel up until this point, and yet Israel has not been paying attention. They don't see that God fights through Samuel, that God has thundered against the Philistines once. He'll do so again in chapter 12. They don't see that Samuel still has some spunk left, as in chapter 15 he kills Agag, the king of the Amalekites. They've rejected their judge who speaks for God because they want to have somebody they can see. They want to have somebody who will fight their battles for them rather than trusting in God. They want a warrior, and they do get a warrior, a one whose head and shoulders taller than all the people, one who is impressive, a physical specimen, and one who has the spiritual competency of a two-year-old. Saul is devoid of any spiritual maturity for his entire lifetime, and yet the people get exactly what they want. In fact, as we will see in chapter 1, as Hannah is praying, she repeatedly uses the word sha'al, meaning to ask. This is the one that I asked for. And yet she doesn't name Samuel Saul, which would be in keeping with Sha'al, asked for. She names him Samuel, which may mean God has purposed or God has set or perhaps a amalgamation of God has heard. But eventually when we get to Saul, the king that they asked for, that they requested, Sha'al, we get Sha'ul, we get Saul, and he is everything the people want. And they begin to realize that that's not what they really wanted. That's not what they really needed. They actually had it better under Samuel. Samuel warns them in 1 Samuel 8 of all that the king is going to do to them. He warns them that they're going to regret their decision, and yet they simply won't listen. 1 Samuel chapter 8 is very interesting in the fact that God had already spoken of a king earlier in Deuteronomy. And so it's likely that God was eventually going to give them a king either way. However, in their sinfulness, they have asked with a bad reasoning, rejecting God as king. They have asked rejecting Samuel, and they've basically asked in their own timing for their own purposes. They want a king that will be their figurehead and whom they can manipulate. And the ending of this is going to be disastrous. Saul will not be the man after God's own heart. Saul will be the man after Saul's heart. And ultimately, it will be David that will be the man after God's own heart, who will be the king that God desires. One wonders if God actually gave them Saul as a punishment, and had they simply waited, would they have had David without Saul? One can only conjecture because we do have Saul, but it is clear that the people have sinned in asking for this king, as Samuel will point out in 1 Samuel 12. They have asked for a king sinfully, but they're going to get exactly what they asked for, which is a terrifying thought. Well, that brings us to the end of Lecture 4, as we've worked through 1 Samuel 1 through 8, talked about the various questions of the structure of Samuel. Make sure that you read through at least chapters 1 through 8 prior to our class session. Look forward to seeing you in class as we continue to make our way through the historical books and as we lead up to David.